Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, um, Hello World for Designers. Um, my name is Alicia O'Brien, and I'm here from Crank Software today with my guest, Dan Conroy, who is my colleague here at Crank, and Mark Wallace, who is our partner over at Fresh Consulting. Um, we're here to talk to you today about how to design for an optimal UX on embedded HMI systems. So before we jump into the detail, Dan, if you could advance my screen, please. We've just got a uh, a couple, oh, hang on, whoops, there's our, here are our presenters today. So we've got Mark Wallace, as I just said, who is our UX director from Fresh Consulting, and uh, yeah, my colleague Dan, who is our design lead at Crank. So a couple of things today, we would encourage your participation. Um, so the way to do that is we will be um, live streaming this on Facebook. I'm happy to answer any questions if you pop them on there. But also if you want to follow us on Twitter with the hashtags Fresh Consulting, Crank Software or Embedded GUI, um, we will be watching there and we will do our best to get back to, uh, to address your comments. There is also a chat on the right hand side. If you open up and expand the um, accordion there, you will be you will see that there is an opportunity to ask questions. You can ask them privately or you can send them to us. And at the end of this presentation, there will be a QA. Um, this session is being recorded. So if you have to bail, don't worry, we will follow up with you with the recording afterwards. So on that note, I'm going to hand over the presentation to Mark Wallace to kick us off. Thanks, Mark. You should have controls very shortly. There you go, over to you. All right, thanks. Uh, well, I'll start off talking about a little bit about Fresh Consulting and who we are. Uh, we got started back in 2007. Uh, we've had pretty huge growth spurt over the last five years. We're now up over 300 on our staff. Uh, we have four offices, two here, uh, just east of Seattle, uh, one down in Portland and one over in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, we scale to meet the needs of our clients and, and their projects. So we work with a lot of mid-sized companies, uh, but we also work with a lot of large companies. Um, and what we do is we provide end-to-end -end services, starting with strategy, design, software, and hardware development as well. But today, uh, we really just want to focus on our U user experience design, or better known as UX design. Um, a lot of people may be confused on what that means. You hear UI, UX. Um, what user experience design is really about, it's a holistic process where we use research to drive our design decisions uh, that better match user needs and expectations. So sometimes we'll get the question, why should we invest in UX design? And usually it's a situation where a client has an idea of what they wanna build and they wanna just hand it off to development and start building it. Um, but the reason to invest in UX design is, is you know, to, to sum it up shortly, is that sometimes your product might not even make it to market. And if it gets abandoned during the process, um, a lot of technical debt is created. Uh, so in this study, they talk about 50% of programmers' time during the project is spent actually doing avoidable rework. Uh, and that ultimately causes the user experience to suffer. So when you have that poor UX, the effects are decreased sales, dissatisfied customers, poor ratings and poor reviews, and that is ultimately gonna negatively impact the brand, uh, could also increase that need for training. So what is the process to create a good user experience? Um, so what I wanna do today is walk you through uh, a recent fresh project where our challenge was to design uh, touchscreen interfaces for four unique restaurant products and create a style guide for their future products. So the main intent of this project was to uh, unify the, the product. So ultimately reducing that need for training. Uh, if they have a couple of the products in the restaurant, if they're interacting with one, they can walk over to the other one and it's going to have a similar look and feel and interactions are going to be similar enough that they can learn it with little to no training. Uh, the other big point of this project was to reduce the, the time designing and developing future products. So rather than reinventing the wheel every time you have a new product, uh, having some design style guides and pre-designed components to work from uh, just really speeds up that process. So where did we start? Uh, the answer is always with research. Uh, we always like to do some level of research 
as it really helps you define the product roadmap uh, based on facts instead of opinions. Uh, this better prepares you to confront what we call the beast of conflicting opinions or otherwise known as BOCO. So if you've ever been in a meeting where opinions are clashing and the loudest voice in the room kind of takes over, then you know what I'm talking about. So what research does is it helps facilitate a more productive fact-based conversation so that you can move forward uh, in agreement based on facts rather than the loudest voice and their opinion. Uh, we do have a website. This is actually a screenshot. Uh, we'll share the URL. Uh, walks you kind of through this story of, of the UX process. So first off, we want to understand those business needs as part of the research. So what, what are the business and project goals? What are the current state? Uh, what's the competitive landscape? What's the technology constraint that we're looking at? Timeline constraints. And that brings me to our first UX uh, fresh UX principle where what we do every time is we build our process around the timeline, the budgets and the ROI. And so we're going to craft our process to the client and to the project as no two are, are really alike. Um, one of those tools we use, especially with existing products, is a UX review where we'll we'll look at the product and we'll look at it in these 10 different categories, give it a rating based on our analysis. Um, and what that does is it aligns the teams on areas that really need improvement. Um, and it tells you where to really kind of focus your efforts so you can get the best ROI out of your product. So that other half of research is really empathizing with the user and understanding their point of view, the key touch points, what are their tasks, what are their pain points around those tasks, uh, what are key influences. Uh, ultimately, we want to define who the people are that are using it and how are they using it. Um, so one of those tools that we use is uh, Persona. So you might have heard of these. What they really do is they align teams on, on who we're designing for and creates empathy for who the users are and kind of the, the high level problems that they're facing on a daily basis. So for this project, we, we boiled it down to four main user types. Um, we had setting Sophia to click Nick. They were kind of our primaries um, on this. So setting Sophia, she was the restaurant manager or the restaurant owner who needs to get into that product and manipulate the settings or even cook with it. So uh, we found that solving her problems kind of trickled down to everyone else. Uh, two click Nick is your, uh, you know, typical line cook maybe, um, or it could be a teenager or 20 something that's just come onto the job and then leaves it in two weeks. So basically they have no time to train uh, and they're just kind of thrown into the mix and they need to get up and running quickly. So just keeping those two in mind, uh, we were able to kind of solve the problems for the other remaining personas as well. So the trick with user uh, research is to observe them. D don't just ask what they do, you, you should observe what they do. Because if you just ask what they do, they're gonna give you a textbook answer and it really is going to miss um, a lot of the details of what they really do. So when you start observing them, you start to see where they really struggle, where they might not have mentioned that if you just asked them, or you might see some little workaround that they created uh, because of problem with the machine, but they're just used to doing it so they they just kind of accept that experience. So that, that's really where the, the gems of creating a better user experience come from is that user observation. So from there, uh, we like to define what the problems are and prioritize them. You know, what are the user's needs and why? How frequent is that need? How does it impact them? How does it impact the business? So in order to do that, one of the tools we use uh, are called user stories. So they really kind of drive the user flows that we design for. And really what it is is just answering these questions. So who has the need? What is the need? Why do they need it? Uh, how often do they need it? So what a user story might look like is something like this. So for setting Sophia, I need to group all my lunch recipes together so I or my staff can quickly cook during the lunch rush. So this is really just organizing the machine for her presets. It's not done very often, uh, but it's super important because it affects two-click Nick, who needs to cook a lunch sub quickly so he can fulfill a customer order in a timely manner. So this is done often, multiple times a day. So the difference is when it comes to design, we wanna make sure this button is prominent, super easy to find, super easy to click, 
versus sending Sophia, something she's done rarely, it's important. It just needs to be, it can be a much smaller button. And as long as it's in an, an intuitive location, then it should be fine as far as a design hierarchy. From there, uh, after we've defined those problems, prioritize, we wanna get into ideation mode. So this is where we're working with stakeholders, working with our own design team. We work through information architecture like site flows. Uh, we start wireframing, maybe even moving into mockups. Uh, we use another tool called invent value. Uh, this is super valuable um, to get your team. Uh, we, we like to do this with stakeholder teams as well. Um, it's basically divided into three stages where stage one, you ideate and super helpful, especially right now for during COVID times, this is all done remotely. You can do it in person as well, but it's really built for being remote. Uh, so stage one, people just post their ideas and no one else can see them at this point. So the advantage here is that uh, you don't get groupthink, you don't get the loudest room, voice in the room taking over. Everyone can just freely post their ideas. Stage two is where they get revealed. Now you can see them. So this is where we're encouraged to discuss uh, options, give praise, ask questions, and really kind of develop those ideas into something bigger. Um, stage three is then when everyone gets a certain amount of votes they can cast and they can vote all their votes on one or spread them over several. Uh, and that's when you see the, the best ideas kind of rising to the top where you can then uh, create action items off of that and uh, move forward. So it's a really good way to get a lot of ideas out there, get people involved. You're going to get better buy-in as the project moves forward because people were involved. Sketching and wireframes. So yeah, it's exactly that. We might be on a whiteboard. We might be in a cafeteria table like this. Um, our industrial designers are really good at sketching on paper super fast. Um, a lot of times we'll we'll do it in digital format as well and just put together very rough sketches focused on uh, content and functionality. And the main reason is just it's faster, faster than doing mockups, faster than coding. You can get the idea out there. Uh, you really just want to focus on the functionality and the content and the flow. You don't want to be worried about the colors or the imagery or are we using sans serif fonts or serif fonts. It's all about the content and the flow at that stage and speed. So from there, you don't want to just imagine it. You've probably come up with some good ideas during those ideation. You want to prototype, prototype it and get it in front of people. Um, so you could do it at the wireframe stage. You could do it at the mock-up stage. But once you start to solidify your designs, you want to make sure you're following best practices. So we'll run through a few best practices for touchscreen UI. Uh, right here. So tap area size, probably talked about this a lot. Um, you know, the average finger is a certain size. Some people have huge fingers. So what we found is nine millimeters and above is a, is a good standard to start with. Um, and that's going to depend, you know, how many pixels you put into it. It's going to depend on the pixel density of your screen uh, to determine how many pixels actually gets the physical size of the button up to nine millimeters. So you can see on this chart, uh, you could get away with seven millimeters. It's pretty small. You're, you're going to get some more missed targets. Nine and above is better. You get diminishing returns as you get to 13 and above. Um, we kind of found through testing 10, 10 millimeters is a good kind of sweet spot for, for your standard buttons. Um, but you could have, you know, a super large button maybe on a menu screen where you got, you know, anywhere from four to six selections and uh, you just want to make it nice and big and super easy to click. Uh, but physically, it doesn't need to be that big. Uh, the standard size here is more the 10 millimeter size, might have a utility button. And then sometimes just because of design and hierarchy, you might want the button to not be so big. And that's okay. Visually, you can actually just make it smaller than the minimum tap area, as long as the tap area around it is actually up to that tap area size. So as long as there's spacing around it uh, to make it clickable, then you should be fine. Um, icons, big, big interaction problem here is when people don't use these appropriately. The main reason is that most icons are not universally recognized and usually require a label. Uh, so you want to use icons appropriately. If it, if it causes too much thinking, uh, then you increase that cognitive load and indecision and it overall doesn't create a good experience. So what I'm going to do now is show a couple icons and I'll give you like five seconds to 
tell me what you think. You can type it into the chat. Uh, what does that icon mean to you? And I'll show you a second one and you can respond to that as well. All right, icon two, go ahead and type in if you have a chance what that icon might mean. And Alicia, did we get any uh, anyone typing in there? <laughs> you know, we did we did not actually if everybody can just have a look, you can enter in maybe you should just jump back and just do it again, Mark, use the chat everybody um, for what there you go what you can see on the screen icon number one to you. What does that represent? No, there's no wrong answer. There's no wrong answer. Okay. All right. And then icon two. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Icons are are abstract ultimately. There's your not intuitive <laughs> point. All right. So I'm gonna I'm going to move forward and, and if you can think about it and type it in, we'll maybe reveal those later. Uh, so yeah, so what happened here is it was ultimately to reveal a language selector in our interface and we'd used that globe icon before, uh, mainly because we just had seen it used before on other sites or apps. Um, but then when we tested it, like no one was getting it right. So <laughs> we adjusted, went back to the drawing board a little bit on that and went with a different icon, which was this icon that we ended up ended up with. And uh, yeah, over two thirds of the people got it on their first guess. And we, we felt that was sufficient um, considering what it, you know the other icons it's around. Also the risk of clicking it wasn't a big deal if they get it wrong, it just opens it and then you kind of learn what it's about. So those are things to consider. You, you ultimately don't want to you know, if you have a string of icons together, you want to make sure they're pretty recognizable. Otherwise, you're probably pretty, you, you have to still put in a label to reduce that cognitive load. So people get frustrated if they have to think too much or if there's too many choices, uh, you really want to avoid that. Uh, visual hierarchy. So you're on a base your visual hierarchy of your designs based on what users need to see from different distances or uh, the specific actions needed for the specific flows. You know, not, not every action has the same priority. So you wanna consider that. So for these products, we had to look at, you know, what are they only doing when they're up at the screen uh, versus what they might need to see from a few feet away or, or even across the room. So an example of what we did in one of our modules or components was uh, creating this cook timer where you can, from across the room, you can see the progress, you can see the time, uh, as you get a little bit closer, you can read the actual item that's cooking. Uh, and then right up front, there's a nice, easy, clickable stop button to cancel that cook. So system feedback, uh, you want to provide system feedback to confirm and inform actions. And what that means is really just creating a two-way communication between the user and the system to confirm that the actions were actually done after you've, you've tapped. Um, so an example of this is just press states on buttons, uh, showing a keyboard here, where if you click on a, a letter that it's gonna you know, create a press state, you see that you actually made contact with the machine and it's entered. Uh, color, color is a big factor. Color should have meaning. So use color to communicate the status or hierarchy, uh, but the trick is don't rely on color alone. Use secondary indicators to account for color blindness. So in this example here, we have these little message, uh, this little message system where uh, there's different kinds of messages. Some are more urgent, some are just confirming you did something good. So the green combined with the check mark or the red combined with the exclamation point. So we're, we're using color, but that secondary indicator. So at a glance, the user can quickly know uh, what the message was about and if there's any urgency behind it. Uh, animating for usability and not just flair. So a lot of times this is really just quick little transitions that help smooth out, um, you know, jumping from one state to the next uh, rather than being super abrupt and jumpy and, and maybe losing where you were before. So this accordion menu is very helpful to have those subtle transitions transitions from open states to closed states. Uh, it could be from page to page. So this example of clicking on a menu item, then then transitioning into that timer state. Um, 
again, there's a lot actually happening in those animations, but there's like a quarter of a second, maybe a half second at the most. It's super fast, but it really creates a, a much better, smoother experience. So um, testing these prototypes, uh, usability tests, task time tests is, is typically what we're looking at. Impression tests, A-B tests is more about, you know, quick hit brand impressions. Um, and the reason we test is that most people don't get it right the first time. Uh, you design and you test it and then you learn from those failures and they, they create insights that ultimately help create a better product. Um, so you want to start early, uh, but test throughout the life cycles. So you could test at the wireframe prototype stage. Uh, it could be a more involved mock-up prototype uh, like you see over here, uh, or it could be a coded prototype. And Crank's going to talk a little bit more about their software uh, and how easy it is to put together a real coded prototype on the actual end machine. But uh, a lot of times before you get to actually building it, it's good to test with users before you move into development. Um, and some people think, well, you got to test like 20 people to really know. That's, that's not really true. A little bit of usability, te usability testing goes a long way. Uh, kind of the industry standard is really just testing five users. And the, the reason is that you could double that and go up to 10, but you really don't gain that many more insights. So you're doubling your budget, but not really getting the ROI from those tests. So testing five users on a certain, uh, from a pr single persona or couple of personas that have the same flow is usually enough. So our tests, we tested these four products, um, ultimately the total number of users across those four products covering the personas ended up being 27. Um, our results is we had a, a plus three bump in usability and score improvements. Uh, we shaved off up to 74 seconds off of a uh, few of the tasks. I think the standard range was anywhere from three to 10 seconds we shaved off, uh, but then there was a few, we, we shaved off a lot of time. Uh, we also bumped up our NPS impressions uh, by two points. And then along the way, as mentioned before, you saw the icon issue. We, we discovered things that needed to be fixed. Uh, and so ultimately we, we knew we had improved a certain point, but then we improved it even more uh, by doing that user testing. So. What that does is it allows us to deliver those designs over to Crank with confidence, knowing that they're not going to be uh, wasting their time building something that's way off the mark. Um, and, and that allows them to build it and then even you know, test it on the actual prototype before it goes to market. So just some things to consider at, at that development handoff or uh, doing periodic check-ins, uh, checking that functionality is, is it may impact the development effort as you create something that's maybe unique in the design. Uh, consistent naming conventions of your files, having a style guide to reference for components, colors, uh, just to create that consistency across the product and other products in the future. Uh, and then post-development, um, it's good to keep designers involved at some point as you get into development. Sometimes you have to pivot and maybe uh, do something a little different than the original design called out for. So just having some open collaboration from, from time to time uh, can really help with that design process. So I'll leave you with one last fresh UX principle, and that is design is a process, not a single event. So even through development, as mentioned before, it's good to keep an open mind to design adjustments and have good collaboration and ultimately just creating a better product by the end. So that's all I have for now. I will hand it over to Dan and he will talk a little bit more about Crank's software. All right. Well, thanks. That was awesome. Um, yeah, who is Dan? Uh, that is me. I joined Crank Software in 2011. And yeah, I've worked with the um, customer design teams and support just getting them up and running. Um, if you've come to our website, you come across a, a fair bit of my handiwork there um, on the marketing team. And then if this voice uh, sounds familiar to you, uh, I'm the voice behind many of our videos, but here's the face. And um, yeah, uh, every now and then I'm lucky enough to get to work with some of our customers' uh, products doing some of the UI design and you know, we'll build some sample applications to show off what our software can do. And then I'm a big defender of the Crank Software brand, left-handed and just obviously all around great person, so. That's me. Um, so to sort of run you through what I'm gonna talk about is just a little bit about 
Crank Software um, and Storyboard, which is our tool. And then some best practices when you're working in the embedded development space. It's a little bit different um, and how that relates to UX. And then there's just some, you know, easy do's and don'ts for design teams. But uh, talking about these things aren't nearly as good as kind of showcasing it. So we'll jump into the tool um, and just walk through a little bit of UI stuff uh, and, um, and throw it on a target device. So um, Crank Software, if you haven't heard of Crank Software before this presentation, I guarantee you've probably used a product running a UI that was built with our UI development software, which is called Storyboard. And Storyboard was built on you know decades of UI design and development experience, um, where there's a strong sort of separation between that front end UI and the back end integration, that system logic. And I mean, really what this does is it enables the collaborative process between design teams and developers um, to work in the same space, but uh, not bump into each other while they're working. And uh, really the tool leverages designers where I think a lot of other solutions don't as much. They've got a, a greater seat at the table, which can really help um, you know, the process. So yeah, we're an award-winning company, uh, award-winning software, and a lot of our customers build products, you know, uh, that are award-winning as well, which, uh, you know, matters to us. So a bit about, um, yeah, Storyboard is that uh, Crank Software and Storyboard, it really helps accelerate the design and development of modern GUI experiences for embedded devices. So our software Storyboard, it was purpose-built for embedded graphics um, by experts who believe there was a better way to build, you know, really great UIs designed to exceed those customer experiences, regardless of what that underlying hardware platform is. And, and basically, that means you know you can develop once and to deploy to different hardware configurations or operating systems or rendering technologies. So develop once, deploy everywhere. It's really great in that regard. Uh, before you would have other attempts at doing this that were far more you know expensive and time consuming and poor performing so there was an opportunity and and that's how crank software got started um, today storyboard is used in medical industrial smart home consumer and automotive sectors um, you know by companies that are winning product design awards like red dot design awards editor choice awards you know we had a customer that picked up some acknowledgments at ces this year um, you know, and they're taking these sort of design-led, you know, embedded devices to market faster and without ever compromising the intended sort of user experience, which ultimately is, you know, what's leading to great products is just that, you know, positive user experience. So how the storyboard helps teams is, you know, this accelerated development, you can import your designs from you know tools like photoshop and sketch uh, they're built-in animation tools and there's a simulator built into the tool as well or you can export your application development to you know tablet or or your actual hardware for your product um, and these things can happen fast and you're able to make changes without impacting you know uh, code and development it's nice that you're able to work with the ui without needing to be paranoid about tearing apart some developers work. It's a reassuring feeling, I can assure you, working as a designer. And also, you know, um, Mark had mentioned a lot, you know, iteration and so on. And, and that is an important part of what our solution provides is the ability to re-import your work and refine and improve upon, you know, what you're working on as you develop your product. Um, so it's a scalable solution, which means that we are able to build our applications for high performance uh, products and then also for very low level MCU, um, low memory uh, kind of devices. And so uh, it's a portable solution. You can switch out your hardware operating system uh, during a time like this where your hardware might be stuck behind a border that can't get to you. Um, you know, that's it's very convenient um, if your supply chain is disrupted that you have a solution that is flexible. Um, so yeah, you have this design tool that uh, you know is flexible across multiple product lines. So in terms of 
best practices when it comes to embedded, uh, the context matters. Everything, of course, gets influenced by that consumer expectations. Uh, there are also some expectations of the designer and then um, how to just kind of squeeze out the best absolute performance when you're entering the embedded space. As far as consumers go, and I mean, this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, it's that touch user interface should work the same way as your smartphone. I mean, we've all got them. We're all very used to them, but now you see displays, you know, on multiple products and you kind of want them to work the same way as your smartphones. But, you know, these phones in our pockets can cost over a thousand dollars and there are these, you know, insane performance devices. And that's not necessarily the case um for the products that we interact with the consumers are not ready to spend a thousand dollars on a thermostat or a coffee machine it's just it's not going to happen but at the same time you know they really want a machine that works very smoothly very well you know that very positive uh, user experience for them and this is where that challenge sort of lies for designers, you know, there's working in all these really great tools and building out these applications for products, getting them up and running. Um, and a lot of these prototyping tools, the simulated applications, more often than not, will you know run on your desktop, whether that's Windows or Mac, or you know you're launching it to your web browser or your smartphone or something like that. And all of those platforms are um, very powerful, a lot of memory, a lot of processing power um, to be able to deliver, you know, what it is that a product team builds up. And so there's a bit of an assumption for high performance, which is good to have. And I think it is the role of design teams to present very, very impressive, you know, content um, and, and build amazing things. But at the same time, applications can be very resource demanding if you've got a lot of gesture interactions and 3D content, um, you know, video, motion design, and so on, you know, that can be very taxing to a system depending on what it's capable of. And so storyboard as a solution is um, a very scalable uh, so solution. It, it can hit high level, you know, microprocessors down to low level MCUs. And so you have this range of, you know, things that you can do. Um, 3D models and a lot of video content and so on, down to very basic, simple applications. So, you know, uh, the challenge is how do you achieve the absolute best performance you can, uh, you know, for the configuration that you're working within? You know, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. So it's always important to be mindful of uh, having consistency in the execution of the application as you build it up. Um, and so guiding, I think, design teams, things that I would always encourage any any product development team, you know, starting out is to make it a goal to test on hardware as soon as possible. And the reason for that is, is that, um, you know, using the simulator in the tool or testing it on your tablet, you know, it's good. You get a good sense of the flow and the interaction and so on. But when you get to hardware, you are then now kind of testing at a very real level. You know, this is how the product will perform, um, and you're getting insight into what that's like. Uh, it gives the systems engineers uh, some insight as well as to how things are running and are there areas that they can improve upon. You know, to adjust, make tweaks, and so on to refine and improve performance. And it's that improved performance that's going to improve the experience for your end user. Um, I'd say what's most difficult, um, you know, for design teams, it, it, you know, from personal experience, I always want to take a design and complete it entirely. And you can refine a design to perfection for a very long time. But I think it's more important to do a handoff um, so that a development team isn't idle and waiting for design artwork. And I'd say what's difficult is the mentality. Uh, you, you'd think that once you've handed off your design, you're out of the picture and you no longer have a seat at the table, but that's not really the case um, with Storyboard. Uh, it allows for multiple imports so you can keep adding to your design as you go along. So it's nice that you could, you know, have a screen design, you know, refined, hashed out really well, handed off so that's in development and that can start moving forward. And then you're able to 
kind of embrace this parallel workflow and have this design iteration in Storyboard where you can go back to design and, and focus there um, and, and build out the rest of the UI, you know, as your con uh, project's already in development. Uh, Mark touched on this a little bit before as well with, you know, motion graphics and so on. It's kind of Goldilocks and the three bears of, you know, too hot, too cold, and just right. And I think that's the same with, um, you know, motion and having it there for meaning or having it there for flair. And yeah, the, that's something you want to use appropriately. And then there's, um, yeah, project content. Um, you should merge images together if they're overlapping and never independent from one another. You know, you're, you're saving a file that doesn't need to be in the system and that's a gain that you get. You know, if you're trimming out alpha, that's something that doesn't need to get calculated um, by the system. And you're really taking every little piece that you can to just uh, squeeze every bit of performance uh, out of your system as you can um, because you are chasing after that smartphone experience with, you know, uh, embedded hardware, which isn't as capable. So, I mean, this is all just setting up to playing around in storyboard. That's that's really what I'm here to do. Um, you know, we can go in, take a look at a design, um, and you can bring that design into storyboard. And, and really storyboard is just a continuation of your design environment. You have all of the assets and all of the structure that you planned and created ahead of time. Um, and then really you're you're just starting to add the behavioral functionality to it and so on and, and, and able to start hashing out and building an application, um, which is really great and testing it on your desktop or um, or your hardware. Uh, so with that, I'll jump over to Photoshop. Um, let's see what we've got here. Yeah, so this is a UI that I've got up on screen. I've just I've got a thermostat here. Uh, there's a climate screen, you know, a setting screen for this device. You know, I don't have a uh, design for a security screen, but you can see that it's alluding to that. Um, and I mean, that's the flexibility that you're able to then, you know, bring in that part of the UI into Storyboard um, after, you know, after you get that design done. So I'll move over to Storyboard and up here, uh, I'll just select the option to import the Photoshop file. Um, so when I do that, you know, I can bring it in. And the first thing is you just kind of want to check out, make sure everything looks the way that uh, you're expecting it to, uh, which is dead, which it does, which is good. Um, here's our image directory of all our image assets. And it's pretty simple to just kind of start adding functionality to, um, to your project. What's over here is a reflection of the layers view in Photoshop ultimately. This is what gives the structure to the application, which is um, which is really great. You know, the design team has a very good sense of where content is um, within uh, their development area. Um, here I can just start adding functionality and select a button, say on a press event, I could do a screen fade that can take me to you know my um my weather screen and then when i hit finish that action has now been added you know to this button here if i select it i can see it in my actions view and what's really convenient there is i can copy that action you know i can move over to um that settings button and i can paste it there as well and so now with that same action being applied there i can just change uh where it's being pointed to so this can go to my settings screen and we can do the same thing that um, takes us back to our home screen as well. So, you know, that's really uh, really quick work to just start adding um, events and actions and behaviors into your project. So I'll uh, I'll simulate this. It's going to pop up on that screen. I'll bring it over, and then yeah, now I'm able to just kind of do a quick walkthrough. Um, I mean, it is a prototype, but this is a prototype that is actual product being built. And you can incrementally start, you know, adding to it and so on. So, I mean, we mentioned the animation tools um, as well. I'll, I'll build up a couple here. Maybe I'd like for these buttons to kind of fly out when they start up. So um, what I can do is start recording an animation, which is super simple. Uh, basically what you're doing is when you, uh, move content around as it's being recorded you are kind of uh, 
creating the animation with the emotions you are doing in here. Um, and I can say that's the first sequence of this animation. Um, in the next sequence, I want them to fly out, bounce back a little bit, um, and then we'll just call that complete. So I'll hit stop. I could call this show controls. And then, you know, here are those steps in the animation timeline. First one is them moving out and then bouncing back a little bit. Um, and uh, yeah, it's fun to kind of set up, play around with. There's a preview of the animation um, built in there. So yeah, you can um, sort of play with the easing rates. So this can ease in, I can uh, ease out. And then adding more actions to the application, I can say, you know, after we see this screen, um, we can run the animation that is to show the controls. And so, um, yeah, An another great functionality uh, built within here is the reverse animation feature. And so I could record a whole new animation, but this uh, will create the reverse animation. Um, so instead of show, I've got the hide controls. Uh, which is great. I'll hit OK there. And now I've got two animations in my project, and I can add that action to the screen as well. It just says, you know, when I'm hiding this screen, when I leave this screen, you know, I'll just uh, do some house, uh, house cleaning up, hide my controls, um, put them back where they were, and um, I'll just simulate the app now. And you can see how we've got, how I've got that sort of built in. So here are the controls they show, and then, you know, they hide when we leave that screen and we go back. Um, so that's moving a little quick. I might want to mess around with the easing rates on the animation and so on, but it provides you that opportunity to go in, make edits, make changes, mess around, um, and you're progressing um, through the content really well. And I'll do the same sort of thing here with um, you know, our climate screen where I can move this over. Um, so it's hiding behind my control. Um, we'll do another one here. And I mean, this sort of thing, doing it in code would be really cumbersome. Um, here, you've just got a very simple presentation, sort of the WYSIWYG um, sort of view to kind of work with your content, um, test it out, and, uh, and it works for you. So that would be the steps I'd take to Hide those controls. So I can call this um, hide the forecast. Um, and then here I'll just offset them from one another a little bit. Um, and in the properties view here, I've got that uh, when they start, when they finish, how long they take, and, and so on. Um, and so here I'll mess around with the easing rates again. I can ease in, ease out ease into it. And, and also you can make custom animation rates as well. You're really limited by by nothing. So I'll just call this um, easing to I'll save that. Um, you can preview it in the animation. It's like yeah, that's looking pretty good. The bar is you know just clipping a little bit sooner than I'd like it to. So I could bump that out a little bit later in the timeline. Um, and then, yeah, that's uh, also I'd switch the alignment to to the bar in here um, to right justify, and this should be looking the way that I want it to. So, um, yeah, it's nice working in this kind of environment because, well, it's just fun to play around with. More fun for me because I'm the one that gets to do it, but it's nice to show off to people on on how it how it is to work with the tool. And again, here with the forecast, you know, I'll just create a reverse version that will um, show the forecast. And uh, we'll add those actions uh, to the screen as well. So here got, um, after we see this screen, we'll show the forecast. Um, and when we hide the screen, add the action, um, you will hide the forecast. And so now I've got those in place. Now these should be hidden in their sort of startup state. So I'll 
just take them out of the way. Um, I'll change the transparency to zero and collapse the width, and then we'll uh, simulate this project again to, uh, to bring it up and sort of demonstrate how everything's working. Right, so it's moving over to our climate screen, got our setting screen, um, and then there's the uh, home screen as well. And there's some, you know, functionalities in here. We've got um, touch zones that uh, extend out pretty far for these buttons so that, you know, that primary function of just changing the temperature you want to be easy to, uh, to hit. Um, also in here, the, um, those buttons for, uh, for the climate screen, they also have glows on them as well that we can bring out in size um, just to give that feedback. Um, you know, if you hit a button that it's going to glow, that kind of thing um, when you interact with it, for example. But um, yeah, we've shown working with it here uh, in the simulator, but I think what's also pretty relevant is testing, as I said, that first point is to make it a goal to test on hardware as soon as possible. Um, so I'll bring in this video here. Uh, I actually don't have any hardware with me, but as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, I'm the videos guy and happened to make a video a while ago on sending designs to, to hardware. I mean, what's nice is that I typically require adult supervision from other developers uh, when it comes to dealing with hardware and that kind of thing. But you can watch here right now, this is set up to export to Android. Um, super simple, it just exports an APK file that you can throw you know, on your Android device. Um, instead in here, we'd be exporting a GAP file uh, with SCP transfer. If your hardware um, is on your network, you, know, you just put in its address, and then the board will have its login credentials. So um, yeah, when you put in the path for all this stuff, here's that piece of hardware. It's running uh, an application with a 3D house for a home control system, um, but we'll uh, execute this application when we send it. We hit run here, it gets packaged and sent to the board, which you can see now. So. This is great because this, as part of testing, being able to get to testing as early as possible is going to give you insight as does this display work the way we want it to? How our touch events, you know, is is color the way we want it to be? You know, does that animation run smoothly? Is it choppy? And you're getting really good insight and feedback as to what it is that you're developing in your desktop environment on actual hardware. Um, and it gives you that feedback that you're after um, and, and, and better insights. Um, I find a lot of times I will design at a very zoomed in view because you know there's a tendency to create pixel perfect, but once you get to a display size and pixel density, uh, maybe you wanna rethink the size of an icon or something like that. So it's, uh, it's very helpful, very useful um, way of kind of working through project. Hey, okay. and there's our logo, yes. For more support, contact support. And there's a very nice man named Jamie who will answer all of your questions. And you can direct message me if you want his phone number, his home phone number. I have it. Um, yeah, so that is just kind of the um, brief walkthrough of Storyboard. You know, taking your design, bringing it in there, getting to add functionality to it pretty seamlessly. Um, you know, we do make it easy. And then, um, yeah, that is something that we'll start running on actual hardware and product and, and so on. So it's a really great uh, tool. Uh, I would say the key takeaway here is that if that looked like something you're interested in doing or if your team is thinking about building a product, um, to definitely, you know, grab a copy of Storyboard with the, you know, we've got a unlimited uh, experience with the trial. You know, there's nothing restricted feature-wise. Um, also, it comes with the Photoshop file uh, in, in the getting started nurture campaign that we have with it. Um, so you can use that actual UI that I was using um, and start testing things out, see how it works. Uh, also, if you have hardware, uh, you should definitely visit the um, hardware demo images page uh, and you can download some storyboard applications, run it on your hardware, see how things are working. And then, of course, you know, connect with anyone at Crank Software. Most of the people here are nice to talk to, and you can leverage their expertise on, you know, all things GUI. Um, 
So yeah, that is, uh, that's my part and I'll uh, move it over to you, Alicia. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Hey, uh, Mark, are you still there? Um, how about we circle back to you with the results from the question that you asked about the icons? So you you showed um, an icon. Um, um, Mark, are you able to uh, yeah. to show your? Maybe if we just put it back to you, we'll. Uh, it's going to make okay. you the presenter, and if you want to put that um that first icon back up on your screen, and you asked everybody um what their interpretation was i'm going to give you a couple of uh, a couple of answers and then you can tell us what the answer is so some of the answers were for icon number one we had uh what are we right here hang on <laughs> we had global we had globe we had world um we had language so could you give us in the global settings? Could you give us uh, the answer? Yeah, well, it, it was uh, originally for language. Um, language, okay. So yeah, that kind of demonstrates the issues that we we found that it was not testing well. <laughs> right. Okay. What about icon two? So some of the answers we got, we didn't get actually a lot of answers to this one at all. I think it just confused people. Full stop. Um, yeah. Change font. Um, people who did write translation, people wrote language. Um, what's the answer? Yeah, so that's the, we tested this icon, it tested better for uh, people assuming it had something to do with language. So that's the one we ended up going with. So yeah, it was to open a, a menu to select your language. Oh, wow, okay, well, there you go. All right, fabulous. Well, I have a couple of questions here that um, uh, I can direct for to the two of you. Um, so, if for those of you that are still in the webinar, if you could just use the um, the questions section there to, to, to shoot me a question and I will direct it out to the right person. Um, so, first things first, I've got a question here for, uh, for, let me just see, it's for Fresh. Okay. Do, 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 do. Uh, this one's from Mark. Mark, is, is the full design process always necessary? For example, if you had a small project, would you still need to embark on the processes you suggested in this presentation? Um, it really depends. And, and we mentioned that we, we do adjust the process based on, you know, the timeline and, and the budget. And so, um, how much research you need to do really depends on on where you are at that point um doing some research versus no research is always better so it, it's definitely some you know something that we could adjust and adapt to the project uh the project i showed was was a pretty huge project you know with four products so we we had to go to quite a few places to observe people uh because it's four unique products versus um uh, you know most products are just products that we do or maybe just one product but uh yeah there's there's definitely wiggle room to uh you know figure out exactly what what needs to done needs to be done so that um we're staying within the budget and, and it's going to provide value okay cool and it looks like you you've actually got up on um, the screen there two papers there a website defeatboco.com um that's a downloadable is it uh, that's the the website journey where it walks you through the UX process, and then yeah, below that is a white paper uh, ROI of UX design, which uh, gets a little bit more in depth on on some of the things that we talked about today. There's also a ton of other white papers up there that that you can download for free as well. Okay, perfect. Um, question here for Dan. Uh, Dan, what? Uh, oh, hang on, wait, just disappeared. Dan, Dan, Dan. Um, what about for those that don't use Photoshop or um, designers that um, may use a different um, uh, like raster, rasterized uh, fonts? Sorry, sorry. Let me read this. What if I design with vector graphics? Do I have to switch to raster tools? That's the question. Um, I know there's. Uh, I think the next release of Storyboard has SVG support. Um, also, there's sketch in terms of, I mean, that's that's vector graphics, and we do have a, a sketch uh, plugin which doesn't export uh, to to storyboards, so you can bring in your sketch work that way. 
Also, there's decent integration between Illustrator, if that's your design environment, to Photoshop, um, which gives you that portal into kind of bringing in your artwork to Storyboard for development. Um, mm -hmm. But ultimately, Storyboard itself as an application will accept all of these image formats in which you can compile. It's just whether or not you're taking full advantage of all of the kind of layout compositions um, that, that you build in, in programs like Sketch and, and Photoshop and, you know, Illustrator. I, I find smart objects in, vector smart objects in Photoshop are a pretty convenient way to have the best of both worlds if you're kind of in between designing and also project developments, uh, having source artwork from Illustrator. Um, and yeah, like I said, Sketch is extremely popular when it comes to uh, UI. And, and, and that's something, our extension, that we're improving upon constantly. So yeah, hope that answers the question. Yep. Excellent, thanks. OK, another one here. Um, and this is also to you, Dan. Can you export code directly from Storyboard? Yes. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess they're they're trying to understand how you would translate your or take your um, take your design and put it directly onto a target. Um, so we don't actually create code per se, do we, Dan? <laughs> they're asking. They're asking us here. We don't export code. We export. We create an executable file. If I'm uh, with a runtime. If, if I'm correct. And yeah, it's not like a code compiler. So, um, but yeah, uh, what was that previous screen I had up for support.cranksoftware.com? <laughs> we'll get back to you, Donald, but I'm fairly sure the answer, um, we, yeah, we'll definitely get back to you with that answer. Um, okay. So on that note, it uh, doesn't look like we have any more questions that have come from the audience, but I have a question for you, Mark. Mm -hmm. We, 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 we work with a lot of um, industries and in particular appliances and consumer devices and you know with the growth in wearables today in particular um, of all of the best practices that you gave us today, today what would you say is the number one best practice that you could um, provide to those that are developing your know, consumer oriented wearable devices today? Yeah, it, it's uh, you really got to prioritize. The smaller you get, mm -hmm. you, gotta, you have to understand what they need and when they need it. Um, you know, the Apple Watch, I think the first one, I still have it. Um, there's some good things, but, you know, there's some things that frustrate you. And <laughs> um, yeah, the tap area is definitely, you know, they're, they're more in the uh, smaller end of that as well when you get into watches. Um, but yeah, just prioritizing what, what needs to be on the screen is, is hugely important and, um, you know, start with the the features that are going to be most used and uh, kind of work backwards from there. Because um, at some point you're going to have to have multiple screens if, if it gets too deep and you can't fit everything on one screen. So. Okay. okay, cool. Thank you. Um, all right. And we'll close with one more question. Um, and it looks like, Dan, this is for you. And it's is it possible to add a zoom in feature using animations uh yeah i mean just about every property elements component within storyboard has uh the capacity to bind variables to it and anywhere where you are binding a variable you can then change the value of what's being presented to you so size scale positioning and so on you know that's that's everything that you're talking about in terms of zooming um so yes that's that's there for someone should they need it um all things are possible with software <laughs> excellent well and there's also um nandini there is a free trial that you can download so um we will be following up with all of you via your email addresses with a copy of this presentation um, and a link to download um, the free trial and the Photoshop file that Dan was using before uh, will be available to you to also um, play with in the free trial um, that, yeah, it's a full, full a fully featured um, trial. So we'll definitely um, yeah, give that to you. All right, well, thank you. And Mark, Dan, thank you so much. It was great to partner with you on this webinar and um, we look forward to working with you again. And thanks everybody for joining us today. Thank you.
Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Bye, all. <laughs>